Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's Friday, November 10, 2017. We're at the huge, the enormous, the gigantic episode 12. I am your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mr. Chad Owen. Morning, Mike. How are you? I'm good. I'm I'm using my second cup of coffee to push through the, the jet lag, and I feel like I need some inspiration. Now, from there in Brooklyn, New York, Chad, are you uh, ready to bring us uh, an inspiring serial entrepreneur? Are you ready to bring us somebody to challenge the status quo? I am. So we're going to go on a journey into the Caribbean to a place called Necker Island and learn from none other than Sir Richard Branson. Uh, founder of the Virgin Group, which has how many companies? Oh my gosh. Can you believe it is actually 400? Yeah. 400. Yeah. And I think we have a really great clip that just introduces us to uh, to Richard and his accomplishments. So I'm just going to dive right into our first clip. Branson was only 16 when he left school, but he was always determined and trusted his instincts. When he started Virgin Records in 1973, he signed unknown 20-year-old Mike Oldfield, whose album, Tubular Bells, sold over 16 million copies. The Virgin stable quickly grew and included the Sex Pistols and the Rolling Stones. But then the business pushed out into planes, trains and automobiles. Today, it controls more than 400 companies. 400 companies. <laughs> yeah, 50, more than 50,000 employees. And it all started when he left high school rather early at the age of 16. What, what a boggling scale. I don't know how you keep track of any of that. Yeah, I... I don't think I fully realized kind of what I was getting myself into from a research standpoint, learning about him. I managed, you know, to make it through one of his autobiographies, but I skipped over the first one and I feel like I still don't know everything I could about him and, and all that he's accomplished in his, you know, 40 plus years in business. Yeah. I mean, I was looking through the, through the list of, of Virgin companies and it's, it's just mind boggling to think he's got everything from, launching, uh, you know, rockets to the moon to, he has Virgin money, which is his own bank. Uh, he has obviously, uh, the airline and so forth, but I, I want to take you back to airlines. Yeah. Airlines, plural. Yeah. I want to take you back just to his first major achievement with Virgin records and to think that there was culture club, the sex pistols, Rolling Stones, Mike Oldfield, like this, defined that that music defined a generation it's 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 like having the biggest rock stars of a decade all under one label and, and that's obviously why he was able to sell it at, at one point for for a billion dollars to EMI but I mean it's truly a remarkable story when you think about the fact that what is so special about Sir Richard Branson is that he's also dyslexic he didn't even finish high school and to think that he can go on and achieve all of these things, I, I find that not only inspiring, but sort of it's a healthy challenge to what we expect from the modern day entrepreneur, which would be probably something along the lines of MBA at a famous business school in the US, mm -hmm. um, you know, perhaps doing some tenure at a large conglomerate, maybe a startup. I mean, he did none of those things. Yeah. Well, it, he, he chose to leave school and a, a private school, no less. His headmaster kind of infamously said, uh, you know, Ricky, I think you're either going to end up in jail or a millionaire. Um, <laughs> but he, he left off a zero. Oh, my <laughs> a God. A few zeros there. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the other thing that I think really inspires me is that he just continues to challenge the status quo, uh, whether he's trying to jump in a boat and go around the world, jump in a hot air balloon, 
get on a rocket to the moon. I mean, hey, Chad, this guy's even been in a James Bond film. Does it get any better? Yeah, well, he had his own reality uh, TV show as well. Don't don't forget Rebel Billionaire. Oh, that's right, that's right. He he's he's really omnipresent, and to think that he first started uh, his journey many many decades ago. And if you actually look at social platforms like LinkedIn, he was the first person uh, on the LinkedIn platform to reach over a million followers, which is really impressive because he's still out there sharing wisdom and advice and trying to inspire a whole new generation of entrepreneurs. I think that makes him rather special. I think the effort he goes to in really just to help other people and to inspire them to do great things. Yeah. What I really enjoyed uh, learning about him through the readings and the, and the interviews that we watched is he has been working what I think is the same process in the creation of all of his businesses. And because he's done it so many times, I think there's some, some actually some really good lessons for us, but I think this next clip really just embodies Sir Richard and just kind of his philosophy on life and his boldness. Um, So I'll just let him speak for himself here in this next clip. Well, I've always uh, had the philosophy that, you know, screw it. Uh, just do it is a lot more fun than um, than not screwing it and not doing it. Um, and, um, and sometimes it's got me into a lot of trouble. Uh, and sometimes, uh, more, more often than not, it's been, it's been fantastic. Screw it, just do it. I think if I had to bo- <laughs> boil Sir Richard down into uh, five words, that would probably be it. it yeah, I, I, and I love it because... What we're going to discover in our journey through his universe is that he has got this underlying courage and tenacity and real fearlessness. He's very Lady Gaga in that sense. He'll just go after things where others will stand on the on the sideline and think a little bit more and ponder. He just goes for it. And um, we've got a lot coming up on the show, which really just demonstrates where he just says, forget it, man, let's just do something. But what's also really interesting is he's not only this courage and fearlessness. You know, there's a lot of um, really smart, uh, really practical thinking. And what's also really nice is for such a squash buckling maverick, you might expect him to be a little rough around the edges, maybe a little hard to work with, maybe a little brutal uh, with feedback. But what we're able to reveal later in the show is there's this deep understanding of how to mo- motivate people, and there's mm. a ton for us to learn from him. So it is, it is once again, Chad, I mean, the breadth of what Sir Richard has to offer, sir, offer us is, is so exciting, whether it's mental models or behaviors. I think it's an action-packed show with, with so much for us to learn from, don't you? Yeah, yeah, and... Don't forget that uh, all of the interviews and books and everything that we're talking about on today's show will be on our website at moonshots.io so uh, that you can go and and check out for yourself everything that uh, we reference here on the show. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll even put up a few bonus clips that won't make it into the show because we know how hungry everyone is uh, for those clips. But let's let's jump into where everything started uh, for his airline business, and we're going to hear a story now about the moment, the exact moment in time that he had his aha. Uh-huh. And there is so much to learn and unpack. But first, let's start with Richard Branson and the creation of Virgin Atlantic. And a lot of the best ideas come out of personal frustrations. Um, I mean, I've written this in my book, but, you know, I mean, I was in, you know, Puerto Rico one day trying to get to the Virgin Islands and, um, and I had a lovely lady waiting for me in the Virgin Islands. It was six in the evening. I was determined to get there and American Airlines announced they're cancelling the flight. And um, so, you know, myself and 50 other people were all uh, upset and I went to the back of the airport, I hired a plane. I was 28 years old at the time, so it took a bit of a risk. I wrote, got a blackboard and I wrote $29 one way to, to the Virgin Islands and went out to all the people who got bumped and filled my first plane. Um, and 
you know, and, it, and, and you know, as we arrived in the BVI, um, somebody said, you know, sharpen up the service a bit and you might be in the airline business. And, uh, and I ended up the next day ringing up Boeing and saying, do you have any second-hand 747s for sale? So, um, you know, so, you know, it was out of frustration that we ended up getting into the airline business. Isn't that amazing? Like, the initiative that he took, when the rest of us would have all, like, packed our bags and gone back to the hotel and returned to the airport the next day, he's like, stuff it rented a jet plane and not only walked around with the blackboard, what a priceless image that is, for $29 uh, to, to jump on the flight. But the fact that what I think is really important is the very next day he's calling Virgin, calling Boeing, sorry, and he's like, I want a deal on a plane. And this ability to hit uh, a need in the market and then he is off and running at light speed I mean, is that remarkable? I think most other people that have created airlines, Chad, have probably taken months, if not years, on business plans. And that's the stark contrast to which Richard is just like, within 24 hours, he'd done the flight and he was on the phone to Boeing. Oh, yeah. I, this is probably my favorite story that I came across in, in learning about Sir Richard Branson because of the speed. I think he raised... Oh, I might be getting Virgin Atlantic and Virgin Australia confused, but um, he got Virgin Atlantic off the ground extremely quickly compared to other airlines at the time. And then he used those learnings to actually launch Virgin Australia even faster. Um, right. I think he started Virgin Australia with only $10 million. Um, That's right, yeah. And you compare it to an airline that started roughly at the same time, JetBlue, and I think they had to raise $140 million to get off the ground. But he, he's able to do that because he's acting so quickly. The speed of which he went from personal frustration to testing a business idea to validating and making money from that business idea to then scaling it in like a matter of 24 hours is insane. But no, no, no. like he, uh, screw it, just do it, right? It fits working, double down on it and keep doing it. Uh, that's my favorite part of this, this story. Absolutely. And and it, it leaves any Silicon Valley startup for dead on speed. But also I think he just really is able to listen to his intuition and, and sense a, a big problem that needs solving. What I think is really interesting of all of the entrepreneurs that we have actually decoded and studied, he's actually very similar to Elon Musk. He mm. moves very quickly he really has a strong sense of a use case where there's a problem and he's a potential solution and he is goes at light speed to bring it to life. And w what is obvious here is that he knows the formula that works regardless of the industry or business that he's looking at. And as soon as he sees these primary pains and gains in terms of the customer's point of view, he's immediately thinking of how to meet those, how to scale those, and how to build a, a business around it. And I think a lot of mo he creates an enormous amount of momentum from that. And as as I think about how to decode it for ourselves and for our listeners, I think we often kill things through making millions of business plans, millions of guesses, and in contrast. So Richard, he just goes so quick, he instantly tests and validates his uh, product market fit and he's off to the races. He literally called Boeing the next day. I think that's a great learning for us all to move quickly into action. Yeah, I, I think fundamentally it's his most outstanding attribute in relation to all of the others that we've discussed on the show, just simply his speed to action. So I really think that that's something that I want to keep learning from him. And even, you know, when I'm doing more research on, on him and the businesses that he started to really understand how amazingly he's, he's able to do it so quickly. And the story of the creation of Virgin Atlantic also, I think, speaks to just a core belief of his and kind of his worldview of just like being a problem solver. I think he goes into every situation and rather than, like you say, giving up, he really turns, literally turns his frustrations into new businesses. So here he is talking about how he goes about taking something that's an idea and then creating a business from it. The best businesses come from 
um, people's bad personal experiences. I mean, it, you know, like people who are listening to this program. I mean, you know, if you just keep your eyes open, you're going to find you're you're going to uh, find something that frustrates you, and then and then you think, well, you know, I can, I can maybe do it better than than um, than it's being done. And there you have a business. I mean, if you can improve people's lives, you have a business. Um, and there is still, you know, people think, well, everything's been thought of. But uh, actually, you know, all the time, that's the great thing about capitalism. There's, there's uh, gaps in the market here, gaps in the market there, ways of improving things here, ways of improving things there. It's, it's right there. It's pretty simple. You take, you know, be an observer and then take your personal experiences and frustrations and figure out how you can do it better. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the thing for me that it really reinforces is when you feel these high, high degrees of frustration, he sees business as a legitimate vehicle to tackle it because the beauty of it is that you solve, you can go out and help people in the world and you actually address problems that they have. But then if you're able actually to do it in a viable and profitable way, you can actually make some money while you're there. And that's sort of the quid pro quo that he's so good at understanding. And that's a huge takeaway for our listeners is don't accept huge frustrations that you see in the world and let them pass by. They're there to be challenged. And if you want to be a little bit stoic about it, in fact, it's the challenge is, is the way. So let's hear now from Richard Branson and, and how he thinks about challenging the status quo. Um, I love taking on the, you know, the, the status quo and trying to turn it upside down. So, um, so I've seen life as one long, one long learning process. And if I see, you know, if I, you know, if I fly on somebody else's airline and find the experience is, is, is not a pleasant one, which it wasn't 21 years ago, uh, then I think, well, you know, maybe I can create the kind of airline that I'd like to fly on. And um, so, you know, so, so um, got one sort of secondhand 747 from Boeing and gave it a go. Yeah, just gave it a go. That, that's that whole frustrations into business thing. I, I think there was a little clue in that clip that we just heard, which was he mentioned how important learning is. And you will find that uh, this theme is in almost all of the entrepreneurs that we've featured on the show. But importantly for him, he's linking learning to challenge the, the status quo. He's so curious. He's, he's often been quoted as saying that he's an insanely curious person. He like investigates these frustrations and quickly comes to a few key insights that kind of launches him off on, on the business. And what, Chad, what I find super inspiring here is he doesn't accept anything at face value and he's quite willing to challenge things that everybody else is, is, is merely accepting. What I'm trying to think is examples from my own experience where maybe I have done this or could have done this, you know, seen a problem or frustration of my own and, and solved it in a new or interesting way. I, I think, I mean, I would love to Im be able to learn from and kind of embody this mental model of being an observer and noticing all of those small frustrations. Uh, a mentor of mine, Gary Hoover, who we had on the, uh, the Fred Smith show, I think he's been keeping a business idea list for, you know, 50, 60 years, you know, ever since he was like a, a little kid. Mm. And he has hundreds and hundreds of business ideas in there. And I think four or five of them, you know, turned into viable, successful companies. I think that I may have to kind of merge those two practices and just be a better observer mm. um, and notice these things, but then be sure to capture those observations so that if I ever wanted to act on them, I could. Although I guess Sir Richard Branson would say, just do it right then and there, right? Get, the, <laughs> get, out, the, get out the chalkboard and, <laughs> and ask people for money <laughs> right yeah, then and there. You're only going to have 24 hours and then you need to be on the phone to Boeing. So you better, better be careful what you start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I, I think that, that perspective is something that I really want to seek out and, and cultivate uh, inside yeah, you know, yeah. everything that I do. When I think about what you were just saying, I, my steps would be to write down the frustrations and pain points, things that you see that just don't work. That's sort of the first thing. And then I think you have to put yourself into an exercise of 
How could you make it 10 times better? Okay. What speaks to you as a massive problem that could be mm. solved in this radical new way to make things vastly better than they are today? And I think, I think the key step that we can all take with this is to see a frustration and to acknowledge it and then immediately ask, okay, well, how, how could that be turned into a business that addresses that? Um, I, I think that's the key thing. Make the observation and immediately challenge yourself to say, okay, how do we go about making this come alive, this new idea, this new approach to improve uh, the way things are at? What if, what if I already have a product or a company, Mike, and I want to try and apply this? Like, so, you know, say I'm six months or six years into something. How how do you think we might apply uh, this into the way that we're doing maybe something that we're already currently doing? Yeah, so I, I would say there's there's um, a couple of things you can do here. I think the first thing is be careful that you're not a solution in search of a problem, mm -hmm. uh, because that's a very dangerous way to engineer any sort of business or product. Because what you're essentially doing is assuming a solution, and then you're hoping to find a problem that, that fits it. And the outcome of that is generally that people are solving a problem not worth solving, okay? Mm. So to turn that around, I would use- So the, you're saying it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> you're done, you're toast. No, what I would do, here's the answer. I, I would naturally think, um, is there a way to elevate what the what you're doing to a higher level. And, and I would simply look to ask yourself, well, if that's what I'm doing, how am I going about doing that? What's the unique way in which I approach the problem? And then if, if you really can, look at the why it's worth solving and what are the positive outcomes that occur when you, when you solve this thing. And when you get into that why space, and, and we're just using Simon Sinek's uh, golden circle theory here, you'll be in a much higher place. And when you're in a higher place, you're able to explore much, much bigger opportunities and all the permutations around it. I would say l challenge yourself to look bigger, to ask bigger questions and explore where that can take you. And the beauty of that is that you often find bigger problems. And when you're solving bigger problems, there is bigger business opportunities. Mm. So kind of just inverting things in a way. So instead of being so focused on, I've got the perfect API for this data or whatever you're building, flip it around and see like what, what bigger purpose is that serving? And you know, how is that connecting with, with the, the people that are actually going to use it and pay for it? Yes. And the reason that this is so important is that people don't buy what you do. They, what you do, they they buy why you do it. They buy how you do it. And so by playing in a higher space, you're able to explore many different products, many different sorts of services, because that becomes the lowest hanging fruit. The great danger is that if you're in a micro niche solving a very small problem, you'll often see uh, competitors uh, copying the product or service uh, you'll often see yourself not having pricing power. And there's all mm. of these problems that come with solving small problems. And the other thing is that most startups end up succeeding in a business product or service that they didn't originally start with. And so that's the other big dark secret of the startup world is that you've got to be prepared to change quite a lot. Once you have a really big idea of the the positive change that you're trying to create in the world, it becomes very easy to pivot and you don't put on those blinkers and become narrow-minded. You have the mm. inverse. You become very open to whatever means you need to solve your customer's problem. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a really good way uh, of thinking about it. I, I'm just worried that, uh, that he's inspiring me to be too much of a serial entrepreneur and, and jump from one thing to the next. <laughs> so for those of us you know, that, that have a thing and we're committing you know, to making it, uh, great. I just wanted to be sure that that we, those of us, uh, could take something away yeah. uh, as well. Some of us are destined to create and build many different things, and some of us, you know, will have our one thing. Mm. 
Mm. Well, I would I would say that that one thing is often made up of many smaller parts. So maybe the way to internalize Sir Richard here is to challenge yourself for that next feature or that next service or that that new thing that you add to your offering. Um, maybe you should look for the greatest frustration that your customers have and challenge yourself to to rapid prototype to test and learn as quick as possible with that idea. And just be mm. audacious in saying, I'm going to have this market in, an, in, in market in an incredibly short time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, think, I think that's a, a great strategy. I think, um, you know, for the, for the second part of the show, we're going to have a look at some, some really interesting things. I mean, how he learns, how he thinks about people and working with them. We have some great advice that for him, from him to us. Also, some contrarian things that you might not expect from him. Uh, we we found one or two really good surprising thoughts from him. So there's plenty more to come. And remember that whenever you want to track back on any of these ideas and dig a little deeper, you can go to moonshots.io and find all the show notes and all those goodies. Um, so be sure to check that out. But um, you've had a shot at one or two of uh, Richard Branson's books. What do you have to report from the the Chad Owen bookstore? Yeah. So the the first book that I picked up was Losing My Virginity, which was the autobiography that he published in 1998. Um, but then I discovered just this past month, he published his second autobiography, Finding My Virginity. And I think because I was more interested in some of the later ventures of his, I, I, I started there. And actually, in between, I found another book by him uh, called The Virgin Way, uh, which is a book on leadership. And pretty sure it was ghostwritten. It's kind of one of those forgettable business books. So I only got about a fifth of the way <laughs> through The Virgin Way before I put it down. And I picked up Finding My Virginity and I made my way through it in like three days. Uh, it was just a really great book. All of that said, Finding My Virginity is is actually a really interesting look and unpacking. He he kind of takes it a little bit chronologically and then kind of sprinkles in some more personal anecdotes in between kind of about his parents, which were very influential for him, his wife, Joan, and, and his kids. But he, he picks everything up in 1998, essentially everything that's, you know, not in his previous autobiography. So you get to hear the stories of, Virgin Money and Virgin Train and Virgin Australia, uh, Virgin America, and and so many more. It, he's also he worked with Kofi Annan to found an organization and and Nelson Mandela called the Elders, which is kind of a non governmental group of elder states people from across the globe to kind of get in, involved in in influence you know the geopolitical landscape. I, I, I think that how do you, all the accomplishments, when you reflect on his beliefs, which of his beliefs is reinforced or perhaps highlighted the most? Like you look at the outcome, when you look at all the things that the way he did it, what do you pick as being like the essential ingredient that, that brought about so much success? It's a little bit of what we've already discussed, and I think what will come up later in the show. I think it's that combination of keen insight into really deep frustrations and how he can see helping people in a meaningful way. Like what you were saying, that, that 10x improvement on what they're doing combined with the just, you know, the screw it, just do it attitude. I think those two things combined is what really makes him unique. Um, he's also really fantastic at putting together the right teams mm. to do those things quickly. Fascinating. Okay, so putting the right team in place, which totally it really makes me, um, reinforces to me that anything audacious, anything that's radically new, it just cannot be done by one person alone. I know we do focus on individuals, but in every single one of them, in each of their cases, there's always this story of an amazing team 
Uh, and I'm particularly struck by what Ed Catmull said about Steve Jobs and um, the way that after he failed with Nex and Apple, uh, he returned a much more humbler, caring person and he surrounded himself with these amazing people of which all of them remained with him uh, throughout his journey. So mm. um, that really works for me. So so that's the book, Finding My Virginity, uh, Sir Richard's brand new, in fact. It's only just come out, um, new book, which we'll have a link to in the show notes at moonshots.io. So now uh, it's time for us to to take a little bit of a pivot into the second half of the show and look at some some really interesting approaches he has to building those teams. Here's Sir Richard Branson talking about protecting the downside. Super, yeah, superficially, it looks like we have a higher tolerance for risk. Um, but having said that, um, the, one, one of the most important sort of phrases in my life is, you know, is protecting the downside. And, I, and it should be you know, one of the most important phrases in any, any business person's life. So, okay, we, we, we made a, a big, bold move from going from music company into airline business. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, I set myself uh, a condition uh, that I could hand that plane back at the end of the first 12 months uh, if the business, if people didn't like our business. Um, and so one of the most important negotiations with Boeing was, you know, we have the right to give you that plane back after 12 months. And that meant that I knew that, you know, I could put my toe in the water, I could see whether people liked, liked the airline, uh, but if it didn't work out, it wasn't going to bring everything else crashing down. So protecting the downside. W- what he didn't do was order 16 planes, right? you know, outright. Mm-hmm. And he just did one, but that one turned into enough demand for him to then order 16 planes. Right, right. And and this this to me, um, I think what's interesting about this philosophy that he really values gives him permission to go out there and turn frustrations into businesses because a lot of people don't think to protect the downside and to make these shrewd moves that Sir Richard is doing. So it almost enables this almost maverick style behavior it certainly feels maverick to us but actually what's under it is is a very strong sort of fiscal discipline that he's highlighting here yeah i think those of us that may kind of go into our routines of you know building things and uh you know sequestering ourselves thinking that that is the safest thing for us to do. I think Sir Richard is showing us that that's actually not true, that you you need to go out and test the idea in open daylight and that that will tell you, you know, whether you're onto something or not. And that's how you can, he's protecting the downside by allowing himself to fail and fail um, rather quickly Mm. relative to what he's doing. Mm. And there have been a lot of failures that he has had and the way he describes it is, you know, I fell on my face, but in such a way that I got right back up and, and kept going so that being able to protect the downside, I think is, is very important for him when he's, when he's serial, serially creating these businesses. Mm, mm. One of the, the things that it shows is how, how ready he is to learn. And uh, that really kind of sets up, the next clip that you wanted to share, Chad. So why don't you kind of bring that one in for us? Well, this just gets, I think, to his his core personality and then the way he looks to other smarter people to help him. And he, it's this fascinating admission um, by a man of great wealth <laughs> that uh, is actually really unexpected. So, so he, here's Sir Richard. Um, you know, to do, I mean, I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm dyslexic, so I know that I, I learn the most from, um, from, um, you know, from, you know, practical experience. So the more one can actually make a school uh, act like, you know, la, la, act practically, I think the better. Um, just a funny story of, of being dyslexic um, and building a group of companies. Um, so, uh, age 50, um, we're having a board meeting and uh, 
Uh, and I said something like, is that good news or bad news? And um, one of the fellow directors said, look, Richard, just come outside a minute. And, uh, and he said, look, I don't think you know the difference between net and gross yet. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, yeah, I sort of got away with it for the last 40 years. But, <laughs> but, so he said, look, you know, let me, let me share. Look, here's a bit of paper. Um, here's the ocean. <laughs> Here's, here's the net in the ocean, the fish are in the net. Uh, that's your profit at the end of the year, the, the, you know, the net that's caught the fish. And the rest is gross, that's, the, that's, that's your turnover. Whew, got it. <laughs> and I, th I thought we were doing a lot better than that. I thought it was the other way around. <laughs> I I... <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, sorry. <laughs> How funny is that? Is I mean, that is remarkable in so many ways, Chad, that clear. The fact that he's so ready to admit that he's dyslexic. He's so ready to admit at age 50, this guy is worth $5 billion and he didn't know the difference. And he's just laughing about it. I find that so humble and so counterintuitive to the archetype CEO. I find that very inspiring. I mean, what, what did you think when you heard this chat? I, I thought it was a great color, uh, you know, to his personality. And again, I think speaks to, he's able to put people in place that do know the difference between net and gross. I think his strong suit really is at the outset, you know, identifying the pain point and envisioning a 10x future, and then putting together the team quickly to execute on that idea. Sir Richard's genius is in that kind of inception phase, and then the just you know acting as a true visionary and kind of protector of the brand. Yes, yes, and and it it really starts to demonstrate there's not one way of doing innovation, of being entrepreneurial, of creating things that are 10 times better. There's so many different ways. And I think the real beauty in what we're seeing here is he's so different to Elon, but in some ways so similar. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a lot like Oprah in many ways. And this to me is really exciting that for all of our listeners, we're just decoding these people and we can take some or all of the lessons from each of these people. That's our choice. Pick the things that, that work uh, for us. But it's, mm. it's so exciting to think of all the different paths that you can take to success. I think one of the things that complements that he's just do it, can do attitude is his truly deep um, interest in building people into the best they can be to helping, to supporting them. And this next clip really demonstrates how his worldview of the business really is. For all of the exciting, flashy, shiny things on the outside, this next clip is, is really powerful in, in revealing his underlying belief in what a business truly is. So let's listen to Sir, Sir Richard Branson talking about how people truly are the business. I think the, 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 most important, uh, the most important thing about uh, running a company uh, is to remember all the time what a company is. Um, a company is simply a group of people. Um, and uh, as a leader of people, uh, you have to be a great listener. And you have to be a great motivator. Uh, you have to uh, be very good at praising and looking for the best in people. Um, you know, people are no different from, from flowers. If you water flowers, they flourish. If you um, praise people, they flourish. And, um, and that's a critical attribute of, um, of a leader. Mm. Yeah, and, and he makes a very important point that I think we can all take away, which is he is all about building people up, praising people, never criticize, always praise. And, and again, it's what a stark contrast. Bill Gates even admitted that he was too harsh with his feedback. He, he often asks Melinda Gates to take care of all the people-related matters because he's so technical, cerebral, uh, black and white, if you will, about things. 
what we're seeing here from Sir Richard is a great attention to breaking all of this down into a group of people that need to be motivated, to, that need to be working well together. And I find this quite powerful, given that on the other side, he's turning frustrations into businesses. He's got this can do, go get them attitude. But there's also this I don't know how I would describe it, Chad. It's almost this disarming uh, care. Uh, for the people that work for him, how how did it feel when you when you were hearing him talk like this? It, it's it's a very nice adjacent uh, idea to his other ones. Yeah, hearing him talk about the importance of listening, I really found many many examples of that in in his book, Finding My Virginity. He it's part of his you know finding the best problems to solve is really just listening to people whether that's in starting the new companies or in solving the problems that exist within his companies. He has so many anecdotes about how he'll be in a boardroom or that kind of setting, and he is the only person taking notes, um, <laughs> which kind of dumbfounds him. You know, he's like, you know, do you think you're above it? Like, you know, how are you going to take action on what we're doing here if you're not taking notes? Right. Um, but I've been really hard pressed to find examples or reporting on on him not being a very supportive and encouraging leader. You know, you would think that you know, someone in his position could maybe become quite tyrannical, but that's not the case at all. No, it's 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 not. And and I think it what it what it speaks to is not only his care for people. I think that the only way you could be so prolific in your achievements, more than 50,000 employees, more than $5 billion worth of personal wealth, 400 companies, businesses, philanthropists, charities, you name it, world records. I think he, it really comes from the fact that not only does he understand people, I think he knows where his underlying passions and interests are. And I think that that's what's so exciting uh, for me as somebody who's trying to to do everything in my career and my professional and personal wealth which starts with loving the area the topic uh, the practice in which I'm involved with. I, I I just want to do stuff I love with people that I love and I find that really inspiring about Richard mm, well then listen to this next clip as Sir Richard talks about just that you know, it's sort of foolish to spend your life not, for, not, not becoming expert at your passions. If you're passionate about something, you're going to give it, um, you're going to give it your all and, um, and you're going to en en enjoy learning about it. Whereas if you have no interest in it, um, uh, you're, you're not going uh, to lap it up. Yeah, I think Sir Richard's definitely someone that has become an expert at his passions. And I think that's yeah. what makes him such an interesting entrepreneur to follow. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Chad. Y you obviously are so passionate about storytelling. What Can you share what your greatest delights, what brings you the most happiness through actually making a career out of doing something that you really care about, that you love to do? I mean, what's the what are the good things that happen for you because you do something that you love? For me, I think it's creating the emotional response in the audience, you know, whether that's joy or delight or compassion or excitement. I think for me, the kind of currency that I trade in is that emotional, uh, the emotional currency, if you will. So everything that I do, I, I, I hope, is in service of creating that emotional response mm. um, from the people that are watching or listening or reading. And, and tell us why that matters. Like, how do you feel when that happens? Oh, you, you feel great because you've gotten, you've gotten the response that you're looking for, right? I mean, if mm. it's as simple as like if, if it's for product or service that's being sold, you know, you're, you're exciting that person enough to go and try it out or buy it. Or if it's a documentary, you're trying to highlight a, a group of people that are doing some amazing things, you know, uh, creating engagement and uh, and compassion towards um, you know that cause is really impactful because you know now uh, in some 
small way, you know, you're furthering that cause um, or helping those people. Mm. And surely that, though, the goosebumps that you're able to give people is a real gift. I mean, this is when people experience these heightened emotional responses to your work, these things are permanently marked into their memory, into their being. You've inspired them, you've taught them, you've learned them. Surely that's the juice that, that keeps you getting up every morning and making these films, right? Yeah, if I've done it well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Some, some ventures more successful than others. But yeah, sure. I mean, that, that really is, that really is what, what drives me. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree uh, more that, that it really is following your passions and delighting other people. I think when you do things that matter, when you work with people and you're always helping others, and doing so in, in areas that you really care about, I think so many good things happen. You end up being surrounded by people that inspire you, that teach you, that you can learn from. But I also think you, you experience great fortune. You, you just create this goodwill that can surround you. And it is so starkly different to people that are not happy, not doing things that they're passionate about, not working with people that they connect with. And so I think that this is a real call to people to not only follow your passion, but I think what Sir Richard really teaches us is to put people first, to put the idea, uh, to put the problem solving first and, and the profits second. I mean, he didn't even know what they were. <laughs> he didn't even know what the profits were. And he had five billion of them in his own bank account. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's so, so, so remarkable. So that that brings us to to the the, the just farm. one one more thing on that that point, Mike. I just sure. wanted to speak to maybe those of you in the audience that find yourself in a place of work where you, it's maybe not your true passion. There's got to be you know to take some inspiration from Sir Richard, and there's got to be some area of your work or your personal life where there's that itch that you want to scratch. You know that that frustration find what is most, you know, find the passions in those nooks and crannies and, you know, pick that up as your side project or your side hustle. Yeah. Um, and then who knows one day it could become your, your full-time hustle. I, I totally agree. Like move into action. If you're not playing in a game that is deeply compelling to you, change the game, uh, go out there and find it. Look in your personal professional life, uh, and just merely ask yourself, what are the times that you're most happy and what are you doing? What are the areas that interest you? Where do you see the biggest points of friction in those areas? And start to ask yourself, how could they be better? I think that's mm. that's definitely inspiration we can take from from Sir Richard. Now, as I was saying, we have one more clip left, and I think this really does, if if just do it, is uh, the mental model of Sir Richard, then I think this next clip really wraps up his philosophy and advice that we can all take with us as we think about how he sees the world and, and the people within it. Um, if you treat people well, uh, people will come back and, and um, come back for more. And, uh, and I think all you, all you have in life is your reputation. And, um, and it's a very small world. Um, and I actually think that the, you know, the, the best way of, um, of becoming a successful business leader is, is, um, is, is dealing with people you know, uh, fairly and, and well. And, and, and I like to think that's how, how we run Virgin. Yeah, treat people fairly and well. And he can say that with the the view across over 400 of his own companies, 50,000 employees, a bunch of world records, and, well, the list, as we've said, goes on and on. And what's always a lesson that I continually learn is when you treat people well, it's, you know, even selfishly speaking, it just feels good to do the right thing. And mm -hmm. it's amazing how sometimes directly and indirectly doing the right thing by others, putting yourself out a little bit, can bring back some of the most surprising rewards that you may or may not have even 
expected. And, and I think that's mm. a really powerful mantra for Sir Richard, Sir Richard to leave us with. Mm. I think for me, it's the speed of execution, the, the constant perspective of how can I turn these frustrations into business opportunities and then the speed of execution to get them done. I, I just see it in every single one of the, the companies that he started. And I think that is what has made him so successful. So I'm really curious how I can learn from that and maybe be a little bit quicker to market or quicker to try. And, and if I mess up, I'll pick myself up off the pavement and get right back up <laughs> and, and do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really agree. It's like, don't, don't noodle on an idea for a year noodle on an idea for an hour and then go test it. And, and mm. I think th professionally, we're particularly the practice of rapid prototyping and also, you know, you will hear a lot of people talk about agile ways of working, which is si mm -hmm. simply just avoiding that traditional waterfall, long-term way of working and being much sprint and scrum-based Small teams, quick validation with customers. I mean, it's like yeah. Sir Richard Branson getting was the, out of the building. Yeah, get out of the building, get out of PowerPoint. It's like Sir Richard Branson was the original agile, lean startup guy. He wrote the book. Yeah, you know, super, super rich spectrum of ideas that he had for us today, from challenging the status quo, and man, he's taken on banks, airlines, you name it. He's He's messed with the best, you know, and um, he just sees everything as a legitimate business vehicle, how, how to turn a frustration into a business opportunity. And, you know, the, the track record speaks for itself. But what's so delightful, what's so pleasing is to hear that he's done it in such a people centric manner. He's put people before anything else. And um, certainly, Chad, you and I have actually worked together with one of the Virgin companies. and. We certainly experienced it firsthand. So I, I think, again, what a thoroughly unique entrepreneur. I think he's distinct amongst the company of the other 11 entrepreneurs that we've reviewed. Uh, he's very unique, isn't he, Chad? Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of working together, Mike, we have a, an exciting announcement. Indeed, indeed, indeed. We are... We are so excited to share with everyone that we are going to do our first and definitely not our last live broadcast. And uh, we had a very official board meeting and we said, well, where in the world are we convening? That's, yeah. that's what everyone wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing was, well, if you're in uh, New York and I'm in Sydney, then what would be strategically sort of in the middle ish between those two. So where are we going to do our first live broadcast from, Chad? Well, fate has us in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, towards the end of the month. And right. you have been working behind the scenes to line up some fantastic Dutch entrepreneurs and audience members for us to do our first live Moonshots podcast straight from Amsterdam. That's right. That's right. We will be broadcasting live all over the fabulous internet on November 24th. We will definitely be in a good place for all our US and European listeners to tune in live. For those who are in my homeland of Australia, they'll need to stay up late. They'll need to get some good espresso, but it would be thoroughly worth it. We will, in the next show, we'll announce some of the guests that we'll have coming on, some famous Dutch tech entrepreneurs We'll be broadcasting live from Amsterdam for the launch of a brand new uh, uh, company that we'll tell you more about in the next show. And we'll even be introducing you all to some rather uh, famous Dutch treats. Uh, we'll have all sorts of uh, yummy cheeses and cookies that we'll be introducing to you because... Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to that part. <laughs> not only not only does uh, Holland, one of the most... Um, original lands of the entrepreneur. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, Chad, the first stock exchange in the world uh, was the Dutch Stock Exchange. Um, yeah, wasn't the first corporation Dutch too? That's correct. And check this out. When I lived in Amsterdam, I lived in one of the 
old warehouses of that company, the Dutch East Indies Company. And mm. my, my uh, apartment was an old spices and ammunition warehouse from the VOC, the Dutch East Indies Company. Wow. Um, so it's so exciting to be taking the show and our listeners to Amsterdam to do it live. Uh, you know, Amsterdam in the Netherlands is just a very special place in the world where the people are super bright, super collaborative, and my gosh, the cheese is pretty good, the cookies are good, and we'll be uh, sharing all of that and more from from live from Amsterdam on August on November twenty fourth. So we'll be pushing out all our messages and all those fab social networks website of ours, moonshots.io. You name it, we'll have it out there, and make sure you tune in for our first live broadcast on the on the 24th of November. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thank you again to all of our fabulous listeners. It's really encouraging to both Mike and I to see the, uh, the listeners continue to grow all across the world in countries that I didn't even know we had, you know, listeners in. So I just wanted to say again, thank you to all you listeners. I, um, Chad, I even had the first situation, you, you'll laugh at this, where um, we had been announcing on Facebook the the shows that were coming up, and um, uh, one of our listeners <laughs> was chasing me down, like, "Where's the show? I've seen the I've seen the the announcements, but I want the show. Hurry up! Hurry up!" <laughs> they, they were chasing, they were like, "Where is?" So that was that was great. That was great. So uh, um, really excited for for the the broadcast on the twenty fourth. But I think Chad, we're going to sneak in one more of our regular shows before then. And what, what are we thinking? Who should be the subject of our next Moonshot podcast? Well, I think to stay on the serial entrepreneur track, uh, we've been looking at doing Jack Dorsey. What do you think about uh, picking him up and uh, diving into to what he's been doing the past decade? You know, I, I love um, uh, Jack Dorsey because... He's shown some metal, I think, the last year or two. He was absolutely the, one of the kings of Silicon Valley, say, three or four years ago. And I used to run into him at the coffee store uh, in San Francisco all the time. We both used to get coffee at uh, the coffee bar down just by Montgomery Street. And, uh, you know, definitely with the d- decline in Twitter over the last two or three years, his reputation sort of was a little bit, you know, up for question. But of recent times, Twitter is showing some early signs of uh, regeneration. And he is quite miraculous in being both the CEO of Twitter and Square, um, a payments company that he runs and is a founder of. So a truly remarkable uh, guy and great attention to product design um, and experience design. So it's right up my alley. And a super smart guy. And again, another twist on the entrepreneurial view of the world, different to Sir Richard for sure. He's probably, it's, you know, I can't even pin him close to anyone else we've had, but I'm super excited to get into his world. Two very special companies that he runs. And I, I just can't even fathom the idea of, of running two different companies simultaneously that are both Silicon Valley tech companies. I don't know if this guy sleeps, Chad. Yeah, it's pretty pretty incredible. Really um, remarkable. But we're always looking for suggestions from you, the listeners. So if you have any suggestions, please you can email us at hello at moonshots.io or check us out on our website, moonshots.io. We love to hear from you uh, and get and get your feedback. Absolutely, absolutely. So What's what's left for you, Chad, in the last few hours of that Brooklyn evening? Uh, I am preparing for a two-week-long documentary shoot before I meet up with you in Amsterdam. So wow. I'm kind of in the final gear preparations for that. So that's what my evening tonight and day tomorrow is going to be before I head off to Louisiana. Ooh, nice, nice. Well, um, I'm going to make my way to the gym and kick off the the dregs of this jet lag. I'm going to um, get ready to welcome in the the weekend uh, with a weekend of exciting things with the the family and friends. Um, So all is bright, not only on the Moonshots podcast, but 
both in Brooklyn, Louisiana, Amsterdam, and Sydney. So let's uh, make it a wrap. And thank you to all our listeners. We hope you enjoyed Sir Richard Branson and everything he can teach us. And make sure you stay tuned for next week's show with Jack Dorsey. That's a wrap. Thanks ever so much. And we'll see you next time on the Moonshots Podcast.